you're listening to Grown and Growing with Sonia Hamlin. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Grown and Growing. I'm so glad you decided to tune in today because I have a really fun episode coming up. My next guest, Joy Johnson, is a beauty expert in the Washington, D.C. area. Joy is a multi-licensed beauty professional and owner of Nails and Faces of Joy, LLC, as well as Joy of Beauty, a diabetic-friendly body care line. Joy has been in the beauty business since 2007, and she is a licensed esthetician, a global beauty educator, and a licensed nail technician specializing in diabetic pedicures. For the last 11 years, she has lectured, spoken, and managed conferences domestically and internationally for clients like Sally's Beauty Group and Salon Centric, as well as Ardell Lashes, Gigi Wax, and many others. I really enjoyed having Joy on the podcast because we talked all things beauty, starting with skincare. And we spent a little time talking about skincare because for me, it wasn't, skincare wasn't something I really took seriously until I turned 40. I figured I'm like, look, I'm getting older. Um, I've been pretty lucky thus far, but who knows what's coming up. I need a skincare regimen. And so I just embarked on trying to find a kind of a basic skincare regimen for myself. We talked about spa treatments like manis and petties, um, eyelash procedures, brows, uh, waxing, just the full gamut of spa treatments. And it's a really fun conversation where I not only learn a lot, but I also share some of my uh, beauty faux pas and all of the kind of crazy decisions I've made when it comes to beauty. This episode was also timely because my son had just recently gotten a haircut that resulted in razor bumps. And she gave me a lot of great advice on how to remedy that for him. As I mentioned, Joy has a line of body care products for people who have diabetes, cancer, or other chronic illnesses. In my show notes, there is a special code to get free shipping if you order one of her skincare products between September 20th and September 30th. Use the code GROWNANDGROWING in all caps to receive that special offer. Now, let's get into this topic. Welcome, Joy, to the podcast. Thank you for joining Grown and Growing. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Sonia, for having me. I'm super excited. Yes, I am excited too. And I, you know, before I have podcast guests on, I kind of like do a little, you know, feel with my, with my friends and my family. I'm like, I'm having a skincare or esthetician on, is there any questions? And everybody's, you know, very excited that you're on and that you um, are going to be talking about skincare and, you know, other, other areas of beauty where you have expertise. So Thank you for joining me. Um, the first question I'm going to to ask really is just to kind of level set so that people, you know, understand your expertise um, is talking about being an esthetician. And that's what you are. That's what you're, you have your certification in. Can you just explain what that is? Um, just so everybody knows and, and they're not confusing it with other um, experts like a dermatologist or, um, you know, or somebody who is not certified. Absolutely. Um, so uh, an esthetician is in a specialty or area of practice that focuses on all elements of skin, um, really from the root to the tuta. So from the top to bottom, mm-hmm. um, including face and neck and body. And uh, we're licensed through our state. So you actually want someone that is a licensed professional, um, not someone that just has, has a certification. Uh, oh, they can have okay, certifications okay. in particular uh, sp- areas of specialty, but you want a licensed professional. So you want to be able to mm-hmm. look up their license information on your uh, state's uh, department of um, cosmetology or. Um, OK, looking- thanks for making that distinction, because I think I said certification and it's a license just yeah. as like a, a a beautician or a hairstylist who has to be licensed. Um, an esthetician has to be licensed as well. So. What kind of uh, services do they provide and what can't they provide? Because there are a lot of beauty services now, especially non, non-invasive 
procedures, like where is the line? Like what can an esthetician do and what does a, a dermatologist or a doctor, I don't, I don't know, ha has to do, somebody else? Um, that's an excellent question. So it actually varies state by state. So oh, I can't okay. give one answer. The answer for Maryland could be different for DC, which is different mm -hmm. from Virginia. And then if they're in California, it's a totally different answer. But generally um, speaking, um, we're able to uh, make changes or beautification or treatment to maintain the health and integrity of the skin. So that mm -hmm. can be hair removal, that can be uh, any sort of uh, acne or um, beautification treatment for the face or for the skin. That can include massage of the face of certain areas of the body. That can include um, also providing uh, things like um, hand massages or foot soak treatments. So anything dealing with the body is what an esthetician generally is able to do. When you go into uh, certain specialties in terms of modalities, there's some estheticians, depending on the state, they can do things like chemical peels or skin resurfacing. Um, some can even go as far as doing um, injectables and those sorts of things. So it just depends on the state's uh, uh, scope of, of work they'll allow mm -hmm. them. It's yeah. And that's something you, you definitely want to check out because first of all, you lead with your face. Okay. <laughs> so you don't yeah. want people injecting or doing a chemical peel, um, something that is really, you know, uh, can really change the skin and, and yes. they're not licensed to do that. I think. So what Correct. led you to being an esthetician? What, what attracted you to the field? So my very first license was actually a makeup artist license. Okay. And uh, I reside in the state of Maryland. So that license at some point became non-existent. And so then I was like, well, I want to have credentials, you know? And so being that I wanted to get more into eyelashes and specialize within that, um, I decided to go back and get my aesthetics license. And that allowed me to, to further continue within the eyelash realm in addition to body waxing was a huge interest of mine. Mm -hmm. I was interested in facials as well, but I really was interested in body waxing because I had never been waxed by a person of color. Mm. Um, and so that Me was either. important. Look, I know you think about it, right? Like, hmm, have I? Um, and so it was always some, you know, European woman with a heavy accent that was providing that service, <laughs> um, which nothing against them. They did a great job, but that was something that kind of was like, you know, there's got to be a brown person <laughs> somewhere. And, you know, that's a great point because our skin, our hair, first of all, our skin is different. Our hair grows out of our skin differently. We have a coarser texture of hair, which, you know, when you're waxing, that has repercussions of like when your hair starts to grow, like razor bumps. And I'm dealing with that with my son right now. He got his hair cut and he has razor bumps and we're like, oh my God, how do we, I don't even know exactly what, maybe I can ask you what happened. Why did he get <laughs> razor bumps? <laughs> Me and my husband are trying to figure out what happened um, and why he got razor bumps this time. And he gets his hair cut all the time, but this time it, it, he um, got razor bumps. It could be a couple of things. It could be um, the clippers could not be clean sometimes. Mm -hmm. It could mm -hmm. be, um, you know, maybe the last time he got it done, he had just shampooed his hair before he went, okay. you know, maybe, maybe it was in close proximity. So, you know, cleanliness of the scalp and the hair mix it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so are you then, saying that he should have, he should have washed his hair before, before he went or he should have, or he sh hold on. Cause my daughter is at the door. No problem. I'm just pause it. Hold on. I mm -hmm. You're fine. This is one of the things I have to edit out. <laughs> Sienna. Sienna. I told you I was recording. Close the door. Close the door. Go to your room. Tell him you cannot come out. She cannot close the door. Sienna, close the door. Tell him you can't come. You can come out when I'm done. Close the door. Very rude. I just want you to know. Sorry. I'm sorry, Joy. Mm -mm, okay. You're fine. I fussed at mine before we started, so it's all right. <laughs> I did too. I fussed at her too. And I thought I was like, okay, I thought we were very clear. <laughs> no anyway. worries. So, 
You yeah, want, I would you clap. Do you clap in or how do you get back in to know where to cut? <laughs> you know, I only clap in when I'm doing it by myself. I'd like oh. clap, clap. But when I'm when I'm not, I just listen and, okay. and edit it. <laughs> no problem. Um, it's okay. So with razor bumps, yes. Like, let me let me give myself a space. Hold on. With razor bumps, are you saying that he should wash his hair before he goes to the um to the barber, which he does, and he should wash it after he comes from the barber? Like I'm not. I'm I would not really I would sure. recommend doing both. Okay. Um, I would also even ask the barber in a very nice way, like, you know, you mind spraying the clippers down extra this time, you know, and okay. mention the last time you had razor bumps. I would also incorporate um, some sort of physical exfoliant for him. So something that has some sort of a granule that can help to remove any dead layer of skin on the hair. So whether it's the scalp or the nape of the neck or okay. if it's his face. Um, because a lot of times with razor bumps, the hair is trying to come out mm -hmm. and then, um, there's dead skin there that's blocking it from being able yeah. to, to actually break through. So then it grows back down and then that's when you get that bump. So usually when you pull them out, that's why they're twisted. If you've ever pulled out a razor bump, even, you know, for okay. yourself, like I get them on my neck, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, so what, okay. So he's at the point where he has little white bumps. Okay. Should I, what should I, should I, I, at first I was like, no, I'm not going to touch him. I'm just going to let uh -huh. him be. And we've been using sea breeze on it. Okay. I don't know. So should we just let it, should we pop him or should we not pop him? So if it's an, it's, it's a tricky thing because once you start, then sometimes people, you know, they have a show about pimple popping. So <laughs> that would be me. I, once I start, I'm like, Ooh, Ooh, let's keep going. <laughs> Um, what I would recommend is clean the area first. And mm -hmm. then if you gently press it and you see that it's easily able to, you know, the, the little white head is able to easily break through, uh -huh. maybe a little pus comes out, then you're fine. If it's something where you're like putting your nails in and you're really trying to get it out, leave it alone. Okay. It should be something that should be easily being able to release. Um, okay. and then I would use, you know, a little bit of the sea breeze and then some sort of a moisturizer in that area okay. as well because the sea breeze has alcohol which is going to be drying but you are trying to kill any bacteria you could also okay. use um no bump it's in a green bottle mm -hmm. my um, husband has that okay okay yeah yep and that that helps to uh, it has salicylic acid uh -huh. which is a really good ingredient to help cut any bacteria and whatnot okay um so i would start there with that and seeing um and then also changing his sheets his pillowcases mm -hmm. Often. he is a dirty boy he I even I tell him a hundred times do not get in the bed with your outside clothes on right. do not get in the bed without taking a shower right. do not he does not listen they, he'll come home from football practice and just fall in the bed nasty yes oh I hate yeah. it and even his equipment okay. so like okay spraying his equipment with maybe like some um not Febreze but a uh, microband or something like that okay all that sweat and bacteria oh. is just sitting on there and it's lingering and it's multiplying. So. And he's dirty. He's 12. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just natural at this age, I guess. I don't know. Sorry, ladies. I, I know this is about a, po a podcast for women 40 and over, but my son. Somebody got my lips. Somebody got right boys. <laughs> right. Right. I'm like, I don't want nobody to think he got monkey pox on his head. So I'm going to you know. have to do something about it. Um, okay. So the reason I'm excited to have you on here, because one of the things I wanted to talk about um, was skincare. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the podcast, like I mentioned, is, is, you know, geared towards women like me over 40. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about the skin and how it changes and what you mm -hmm. should be doing mm -hmm. um, with your skin. So I guess I want to start at the very, very basic. I feel like people should know this, but mm -hmm. Um, I know there are different hair, um, skin types, like oily, mm -hmm. dry, and then combination. Mm -hmm. Are those still valid? And how much should we be paying attention to skin typing? Is that still a thing? Or is it like hair typing where it's not really a thing anymore? It, well, <laughs> yeah, with well, hair, it's more about porosity, but that's a whole other topic. But right. yes, it is still a thing. Um, and you're right. You have combo, you have oily, you have dry, and you have normal. Mm -hmm. Um, those are still the skin types and they can be different in different parts of your face. Right. Um, so you can have, you could be combi in the, t combi, 
combo on the T-zone, dry along the chin area. You know, you can have a combination of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you deal with things like eczema or psoriasis, that may just be in certain parts of the face. So right. um, those things are still valid. Um, and they're still important because it helps you to understand what types of products that you need. Mm -hmm. um, if you are someone that is oily, um, you know, meaning that the, those sebaceous glands are, are excreting more oil or producing more oil. Mm -hmm. You don't want something that's very emollient. Think of like a, a aquaphor based right. moisturizer, right? Okay. Because you're now going to stifle the skin and you're going to make all, you're going to trap all of that oiliness. Oh yeah. Because aquaphor is thick. I would never. Exactly. <laughs> it's so exactly. thick. It, yeah. It's very thick. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it is important to have an understanding as to what you are, but it's also important to understand it, that it changes throughout the year even. Mm. Okay. So you don't yeah, want right. to be, um, you know, you don't want to be so perplexed as to what it is at that exact moment, just because um, it can change. So it's not uncommon to need two sets of skincare, something for mm -hmm. the winter, something for the, uh, you know, winter and fall and something for the spring and summer. Um, yeah. It's very, it's very common. So, so full disclosure, I, I, I really have not paid attention to my skin ever. Mm -hmm. Like until I turned 39, I was like, I think I need a skincare regimen because uh -huh. I'm going to be 40. Right, right. But honestly, thanks to my jeans, I, I'm going right. to say it's my jeans because I didn't do anything because I definitely did. I washed my face with water for years. Like I never, it's just, I never had a problem with skin. I never had a problem with acne. Like I would get pimples every now and then. I still will get a, what I call an invisible pimple where it's like there, but like invisible, but it hurts. Right. Um, but for the most part, I, I haven't, I haven't paid attention to my skin at all because I, it hasn't been a problem for me. Right. Um, and I just started to use, I, I started to do a skincare regimen because I felt like, well, I haven't been doing anything for the first 39 years of my life. And maybe I'm going to be I'm due for a crack. And I don't want to be the only black person out here whose skin is cracked. So <laughs> let me start doing a skincare regimen. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just tried different products. And like you said, like there are some, like with moisturizers, for example, um, some are thick and some are thin and, you know, it was, right. it was a trial and error to kind of figure out what was right for me. So right. some of these questions may be very basic because I don't know, cause I didn't pay attention really. Mm -hmm. um, and so the next thing, you know, I, I know that if you're over 40, whether you want to admit it or not, you are perimenopausal, <laughs> you're perimenopausal. And I was looking up like how that might change your skin type and they said it first of all it's scary anytime I feel like it's when you're having a baby it's like ooh, that's a symptom and it's like 50 million symptoms but um mm -hmm. it it I did read that it can change your skin um type Absolutely. when you're going through when you're perimenopausal can you talk a little bit about what what might happen I think you know when you're when you're going through this phase sure absolutely so sometimes perimenopause can can make things a little tricky. Sometimes it changes the skin to being dry and itchy. Mm -hmm. um, and you can experience both of those things while having hot flashes. <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> it can be really um, kind of a unicorn of a situation because you're like, okay, you know, I'm hot, I'm sweating profusely, but yet my skin is dry and I'm itching. Like what, what is going on? So wow. there are mm -hmm. so many hormonal changes and I do attest it to like, you know, pregnancy or um, puberty, mm -hmm. you know, where your body is just sending all sorts of signals. So sometimes you will have to address um, different things that don't correlate in tandem, um, which is why sometimes seeking a professional like a dermatologist um, in addition to an esthetician can be helpful. But right. I would say basic skincare, you want to do um, cleanser, moisturizer, some sort of an exfoliant mm -hmm. um, and that can be a physical exfoliant or a chemical exfoliant, uh, a serum and um, an eye cream. Okay. So, now I don't use eye cream. Okay. Wait. So, um, so uh, some type of face, can you repeat that? No <laughs> a face wash. Yes, you started so there. Cleanser. Some type of cleanser. Mm -hmm. so no, you don't need a toner, toner. Um, you can okay. use a toner. Toners are more for, um, especially people that heavily wear makeup, I think should do toners okay. 
because it's going to really deep clean those pores, get out any traces of, of um, concealer and foundation and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Toner is also good for people that are extremely oily because again, okay. it helps to kind of deep clean. Um, you don't have to do a toner. Sometimes your cleanser has a toner in property it. Oh. in it. Okay. Um, so, you know, that would be sufficient as well. And um, one other thing that I will add, I'm sorry, is SPF, but that's during the day. So at night, I would say cleanser, moisturizer, some sort of an exfoliant. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that could be something with granules in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you do that every night or you do that like twice a week? Like how often do you exfoliate? Exfoliation can be once or twice a week. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, your daily is going to be your moisturizer, your cleanser. Um, then you're going to have your eye cream. Mm-hmm. And then during the day, a moisturizer, uh, uh, SPF. Okay. Yeah. So those and- would be, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say with the moisturizer, if you have oily skin, uh-huh. it's, di- it's hard to wear. Cause I don't have, I guess I do have oily skin a little bit. I'm first of all, I'm hot right now. So I'm sweating, <laughs> but it makes it hard to, especially in the summertime to find yeah. a, a moisturizer. So is that necessary? Is that necessary? If you have oily skin, it's still a moisturizer is still necessary. It is because mm. oil is not moisture. Um, okay. So you do need to hydrate the skin. You do need to provide ingredients that are going to help keep the skin's elasticity, Mm -hmm. um, which which sweating and oiliness are not necessarily going to do that. The good thing with having combo oily skin, though, is it does it does lessen the signs of aging because you're Mm -hmm. less likely to see wrinkles. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think we always use, you know, black don't crack because (laughs) we tend to be on the oilier side, not all of us, Mm -hmm. but uh, we tend to be on the oilier side, which is a benefit because we tend to look younger than what we, you know, actually are. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say that um, you still need a moisturizer. Like you had explained earlier, you have some that are super thin, you have some that are super thick. So in the summer months, you would use one that's very thin that will give you all of the uh, ingredients that you need to help make your skin healthy. Um, And so it's still super important. Same thing with SPF, you know, Mm -hmm. even though you might have a a foundation that has SPF or your moisturizer has, might have SPF, think of it like um, Tylenol. You have baby Tylenol and you have Tylenol. What is the difference? So are you saying that you need a SPF outside of your moisturizer. So if your moisturizer has an FPF, SPF, you need, wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was enough to just have it in the moisturizer. No, because you're not applying enough of the moisturizer um, to actually give you the sufficient amount. So you probably need about uh, one to two tablespoons worth of SPF. We don't mm-hmm. put enough, typically put enough more, uh, SPF on the skin. We normally just put like, you know, that, that, that. <laughs> And we're like, wow, you have my, you have it down. That's exactly what I did. (laughs) Yeah. I'm done. (laughs) Wait a minute. How much SPF? Yeah. You need, you need about a lot of, you need about a tablespoon. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually supposed to, that, that gives you the full coverage. So even if you have it inside of your, um, inside of your foundation, it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not enough. It is something. So I don't want to be discouraging, but you have to think of it like, like Tylenol, if you have baby Tylenol and adult Tylenol, the difference is the dosage, the, the mm-hmm. strength, right? Mm-hmm. So the amount of SPF that you're getting in that uh, in that tinted moisturizer or in that foundation is not going to be enough to actually give you the full coverage because the sun is really powerful, right? So um, it's going to help to um, you know combat aging and sun damage. To so do you put the you put the SPF on first or do you put the moisturizer on first? You put the SPF is on last. Oh, the SPF is on last. So moisturizer, Mm -hmm. then your um, sunscreen. Yes. Um, Okay. Now, black people, sunscreen. Yes. Two two things. One, I think people are getting over this though. I think people, I hope people are getting over the fact that black people don't need sunscreen. We do. Even though we have this beautiful melanin. Yes. In our skin, we still need to use um, sunscreen. Sure. Yes, because cancer, skin cancer sees no color. Yeah. 
So yeah, we definitely need sunscreen. We need it all. I, I love the sun. I I am a lover of the sun. Give it mm -hmm. to me. It literally gives me energy. If I'm in the house working all day and I'm feeling kind of down, if I go outside to water my plants yeah. or just walk around my house, I'm instantly revived. So yeah. I, I love a little sun, but you need SPF and you actually need it all throughout the year, not just when it's hot outside because SPF, uh, you have UVA and UVB rays. They are out whether there is sun out or not. So even if there's whether an it's overcast, cloudy. yeah, yes, okay. there's still sun rays that, and that's what causes the effect in the skin. So you can still get sun damage and you can still get skin cancer um, mm -hmm. with or without our beautiful melanin. So. So what kinds of, so the other problem with sunscreen usually for black people is that it leaves that white cast on your face. Yes. And so it's like, it's fine for my arms when I'm at the beach, but when you have to layer on makeup or go out. So yes. can you recommend um, sunscreens for black people? Do you know any? Um, I do. Okay. There's one called Black Girl Sunscreen. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> yep. It is yeah. wonderful. It literally melts right into your skin there's no cast you don't look like you are casket ready on a sunday morning <laughs> it is fantastic it has like avocado oil it has mm, such great oils okay. in them so i still put on my moisturizer and then i put on my black girl sunscreen so because i don't like feeling like i'm constantly rubbing stuff on my face and because sunscreen can be a lot to rub it all in this one is a lot thinner than your typical sunscreen so you don't mm -hmm. feel like you're rubbing for days and they've actually just come out with a, with a co consistent spray version. So what I do oh. is while I'm um, in the summer, I don't put on lotion. I put on a, sh I put on a oil shower after shower body oil. And mm -hmm. then I take my sunscreen and close my eyes and just spray all over my body. And mm -hmm. that moisturizes me as well as it protects me from the sun. So I've got my moisturizer because I put my oil on first. And then I put on the black girl sunscreen spray. It's super easy to put on my kids. Cause I'm like, come here, shh, turn around. Okay. Shh. That's so, awesome that they have a spray. Cause you, I mean, the, we didn't have these products for us and I'm sure there are other, well, if there's a black girl sunscreen. I'm sure that there are other um, brands specifically for black, black women or black people rather. Yes. Um, so that's good to know. I didn't know that they had a spray. So that's awesome. And I haven't yeah. tried it either. Cause I'm still like, you know, I actually, I was one of those people who thought that because it was in my moisturizer, I didn't yeah, need it. <laughs> everybody, it everybody did. They were like, okay. oh, I'm good. The, the other thing too, is when sunscreen is inside of something, it usually, it usually makes the product expire sooner. So if it's in you your- You just burst all my little bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you deflate. You were like- oh. <laughs> so check the expiration date on whatever product you have that has sunscreen in it there is an expiration date because sunscreen does expire all things expire okay but um you do want to check that because it will um sometimes change the integrity of the product that it's in so check okay. your moisturizer and check your foundation and then I want to, I want to say this too because you so while we're talking primarily about face you also yeah neck like that's one thing that I always try to get because I don't want a wrinkly neck yes <laughs> like but how far down should you go you should go um, to your decollete you should go okay. to where this you collarbone see area your okay. collarbone area yeah you want to bring your moisturizer and all that stuff here oh, and you want to like go this. in an upward motion mm -hmm. I know it's hard but once you get it it's like riding a bicycle you got it because gravity already pulls you down so we're mm -hmm. fighting a co against gravity, which is constant. So you always want to work in an upward motion. And that's mm -hmm. why when we're performing your facial, we're working from behind you and we're doing all of those oh, movements. Oh yeah, they do do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In an upward. So you always, when you're applying your moisturizer, same thing. So you can still do your dots and then you want to work upward when you're doing your application. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about serums. I, I didn't find out about serums until I was... Uh, honestly, until Instagram, okay. <laughs> because Instagram introduced me to serums. I didn't know. Um, yeah. The one that I'm most familiar with is vitamin C serums. I don't okay. even know what they do. Honestly, I don't, but I do use a vitamin C serum. Okay. Um, is, what is it about serums and is vitamin C the, the one you should be using or are there other types of serums? 
There are all types of serums depending on what your concern is. So vitamin okay. C helps with hyperpigmentation, helps with evening out the skin. If you've okay. ever heard um, the old wives tale, cut a lemon and put it on to help oh, lessen yeah. the darkness on your knees or elbows. It's because mm -hmm. of the vitamin C in them. Okay. Um, so vitamin C is great. They have other serums that are specifically to help in a particular area. So you may have an antioxidant serum, which is going to help with maintaining your um, bar skin barrier, keeping the integrity of the skin nice and strong and layered. Okay. Um, you have other serums, like sometimes you even have retinols, which can come in a serum form and they usually are in a small package. Um, and they usually are only going to allow you to pump a small amount out because they're highly concentrated. So you can think of serums as, you know, kind of that B12 shot that if you ever, you know, go and do those sorts of things or take your daily vitamins, it's kind of a daily vitamin, or it may be a weekly vitamin of whatever, um, challenge or thing you're trying to combat. So, mm -hmm. or like a retinol, um, you may use that to resurface the skin to help, um, allow the skin to remove that texture. Sometimes you feel like a little bit of just constant texture as you rub your hand okay. across your face. So mm -hmm. it's going to help the cells on your skin to accelerate in terms of mm -hmm. turning over faster because a part of menopause or perimenopause or just as we age in general, our body is slower to recover itself. So it when you were five and you skinned your knee, you got to scab that night. You know, at mm -hmm. 45, you skin your knee, you get a scab two weeks later. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm being dramatic, but mm -hmm. it, <laughs> it takes a little shows, bit longer. It just takes a little bit longer. So those little power shots or serums or little boosts are going to help give you a high dosage of whatever specialty ingredient to help mm -hmm. combat whatever your concern is. How do you know if you, so, so should you decide yourself if you need retinol or should somebody tell you you need retinol? You should let right? someone let you know. Um, okay. I mean, the over-the-counter over ones are relatively safe um, without under guidance, but you don't want to start um, resurfacing the skin and that's not really what you need. You don't necessarily okay. want to self-diagnose. So mm -hmm. um, under the guidance of an esthetician, um, they can let you know this will help you with this problem. Um, same thing with a dermatologist. And I would say you should see your esthetician at least four times a year. So at least mm. when the seasons change at a minimum, I see my esthetician. Um, I do every four to six weeks is my regimen. Oh, wow. Her. That's often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and that's just because we do so much to our skin on a daily basis. So it's also an opportunity for me to relax and go to sleep and snore mm -hmm. in her ear. <laughs> you have nice skin, so it's worth it. <laughs> whatever well, you're you. doing, it's great. <laughs> but I just lay there and just let her do whatever. I'm like, mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a part of what makes me happy. I, even though I'm in beauty, I still love all things beauty. And so, mm -hmm. Um, my esthetician, she's local in the DMV area. She does great treatments, great services. Um, and so that's something that's super important. Dermatologists, you should see them at least once every six months. Um, even so, if you don't have an issue, even if you haven't identified an issue, you should go see a dermatologist. I've never seen a dermatologist. You should, okay. you should okay. find out preventive care. So mm -hmm. there's a difference between just living and kind of living health in a healthy lifestyle. Right. You can think of it like that. Like you have people that are just genetically uh, fit looking, mm -hmm. but when you actually do a fitness yeah. test, they're not that fit. They just look the part. Mm -hmm. So kind of the same thing with your skin. You don't have any challenges or concerns, but they may be able to tell you what you can do to maintain what you have right. just because as we get older, the maintenance becomes a little bit more um, okay. in terms of keeping that same look. So. I'm going to do that because I would like to look like this uh, <laughs> for as long as I can. Um, so when you're going to to shop for products, I mean, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, it, hair and it, hair and skin kind of remind me of each other. I remember going natural and trying yeah. every natural product that came out. I yep. feel like it could be the same with skin. So how do you know, first of all, you it's, ex it's, it's expensive. So you want to make, I like, you can't try every product, but how no. do you search for products that would be good for you? And how often should you change products? Cause as your skin changes, then the product, sometimes you, you have a product and it's like, dang, this is not working anymore. Right. 
Absolutely. And it's like, so how do you, how often should you change your products? Um, I guess as your skin tells you, or is there another rule of thumb? I think it's a couple of, you need a few tools in your tool belt. I think you, you can do some DIY, you know, you might see something online and you're like, oh, let me try that out. Um, you first want to think kind of what, what is your goal? You know, what, what are you trying to solve or mm -hmm. what are you trying to maintain or what are you trying to do? Right. Um, for me, as I'm getting older, my focus is using clean products as much as possible because we now understand that, um, typically speaking products that are meant for, especially the African-American community tend to have 10 to 20 times more chemicals than they have for mm. non-African-American communities, right? right? So if you compare them to our white counterparts, they might have five ingredients. Our product has 20. Well, why we have, why we got to have 20. Right. <laughs> so right. my focus is as I've gotten older has really been trying to be as clean as possible with my products, wanting to understand the ingredients. What is the purpose? Why am I using this? Um, versus kind of just doing something because either I was told when I was little to do it, you know, yes. or because auntie said, use this cream baby. And this is going to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, so or cause Instagram, I mean, there's or, so, there's so many influencer like facial try this yes. product and then there's this, and then there's this. And I'm like, are y'all using all these products? Right. It's, a, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. And you see their skin and it's like, you know, I think this, well, is the, this is the other, like glass, like that was in for a while where your skin had to look like glass. It really just looked yeah. shiny and oily to me, but right. you know, whatever works for you, right. uh, like the glass skin. And then it's like the flawless skin. And then it's like the little, you need the little, like a, a, sh a shine, like a, not a shine, but a, like know. a semi-matte, you know, yeah, a little, matte. And yeah. then it's a dewy and then it's a this, so yes. you just end up accumulating a yeah. lot of products but really how should your skin be should i mean i guess if you want to look walk around looking like you have glass skin more if power you to you walk around looking juicy god bless you you know <laughs> you like it i love it you know go for it um <laughs> that's what I'm, you want i'm not you know I don't, <laughs> you know but um you can look juicy or matte and still be healthy so right. you know you just you want to find um you want to use products that are going to help you achieve that in in the most healthy way possible but yeah um i mean there are certain sites like black and green which is a really great site it's a marketplace of black artisans that make green hmm. products um oh. so that entire marketplace has all kinds of brands on them from uh aluminum free mm -hmm. deodorant to products for your babies to products for yourself to skincare um so that's one thing one way you can look if you're looking for um products that are black owned, or if you're looking okay. for clean products that that would help you do that. Um, your esthetician, I would start seeing an esthetician. Um, they're going to be able to make recommendations and help you know, um, what things will work best for your skin. And then mm -hmm. you can always use them as a sounding board. Hey girl, I saw this on Instagram. Should I get this? And they can go right. heck no, or yes, you can try that. <laughs> okay. And you so, mentioned, I meant to ask you this when you were running down the, um, the basic skincare uh, yes. regimen. You mentioned eye cream. What is yeah. eye cream for? Why do so you need I, eye cream? So the skin around the eye is actually different from the skin on the rest of your face and body. Okay. Think of it like the skin on the bottom of your, the soles of your feet. That skin is different than, you know, your back skin. Right. So because we know the eye skin is the most delicate and it's the thinnest skin on the body, there are moisturizers and hydrators that are intended just for that area um mm -hmm. some products you can't and it's not recommended to put up near the eye like some of the uh, serums are not recommended to be close to the eye um they can become irritable to your actual eyes mm -hmm. or to the skin there because it is different um so moisturizers for the eye or eye creams help with uh darkness it can help with um uh, uh fine lines and wrinkles or crow's feet Okay. Um, it can help to target that particular area. If you have extreme sagginess or some sagginess on the lid, some eye creams can help with firming the skin. Okay. Um, and and so, you do that at night or do you, do they have daytime eye things? You, you eye normally eye. do that at night. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So when you're, when you're at rest, when you're sleeping is when their body is able to kind of 
um, regenerate itself and and fix all the things that we did to it during the day. And mm-hmm. at night is the best time for that eye cream to to settle in. Okay. So there's a lot. We've talked a lot, a lot about products and what kind of products we need. Mm-hmm. You know, health obviously starts from within. It also yeah. comes from the food we ate. So what, yes. what can you recommend in terms of um, making your skin glow or be healthy naturally? And it's not, that does not come from a product. Um, definitely what you're eating is, okay. is extremely important. Uh, water, water, water. Um, we hear it all the time. Add a little lemon if you need to, but mm-hmm. you're supposed to drink half of your body weight in ounces. So okay. if you weigh hundred pounds, you should be drinking at least 50 ounces of water per day. Okay. Um, and that will help eliminate a lot of challenges, scalp mm-hmm. issues, Um, and so that will definitely help for the skin to kind of, um, be seen, uh, less is more. So maybe not as much makeup, maybe doing just a little concealer to brighten up under the eye, um, some great mascara and a lip and maybe fill in a brow and be done. You know, you, you have said my makeup regimen. I mean, after the pandemic, I'm like, I, first of all, I, I find it hard to find a foundation that matches my skin exactly either it's too yes. yellow like yes. the undertones are too yellow or they're too red yeah and so I just gave up and now I just use um concealer under my eye and that's it yep <laughs> it's like just brighten it up and keep on moving I actually have to use two shades so here I'm yellow and lighter but then mm-hmm. around the perimeter I'm I'm red and darker right. so I totally get it with uh with your challenge so it's not uncommon to have to use two shades sometimes three because, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes our skin is just not all one shade. And so that's very common. So since we're on makeup, I'm going to uh, jump to makeup just a little bit because, I mean, you know, makeup is so personal. It's fun. I'm not yeah. here to like regulate what people should be doing with makeup. But, you know, what are some things as we get older, are, are there things that we could should probably do less of? Um, and not from a style perspective, but maybe from the health of your skin perspective, right? Because I don't want people to be like, I can wear, I can pull a face if I want. It's right. Fine. You can. I can do it. But I'm just asking, like, do you want to let your your face breathe more? Do you want more lighter foundation? Like, you know, yeah. how you know, how should you should your makeup change or or are you yeah. cool with just going with with what you always done? It should change, I think, just like your skincare during the seasons in the summer. I personally like to do less because it's hot. And if you, if you're going through flashes, you hot. So, (laughs) you know, adjust accordingly. And then in the, in the winter months, I may do more of a cream based foundation. Whereas in the summer, I might do a tinted moisturizer or like Mm -hmm. we talked about just the concealer under the eyes, Uh, maybe just some powder, you know, just so I'm not shining from here to Sunday morning. But, um, but absolutely you adjust based on the seasons, you're going to need different foundation colors in the winter versus the summer because you Mm -hmm. tanned more in the summer than you are in the winter so understanding that so um I think it's completely normal to just adjust as you see fit um I don't mind wearing a little bit more makeup in the winter time because we're putting on layers everywhere else you know (laughs) kind of like why not (laughs) pile on the layers and I mean COVID is not it's not gone, but you can't really tell because everywhere I go, like I'm like either the only person wearing a mask. Most people are not wearing masks anymore, which, you know, it could be a good thing. We'll see this winter because summer, right. summer has been fine. The numbers have been fine, but winter we'll see. I work in healthcare, So anyway, right. <laughs> so winter could be, you know, a different story. But, you know, I actually missed wearing lipstick. I missed wearing, yes. you know, I would just, you know, kind of do up the eyes and stuff because you couldn't, you know, wear lipstick. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, masks are, I don't know, optional. Optional. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about, um, spa services. I mean, there's, I, I know, um, you in particular, you, you do a lot of, a lot of spa services. So I want to talk about some trends that I'm seeing in each one of the areas of spa, okay. um, starting with like, Manny, Manny Petties, manicures and pedicures. Mm-hmm. So, um, I get my nails done. I y- use gel. I've used gel. I've used all of it. I use gel. I've used acrylic. Mm-hmm. I've used now there is, um, something called gel ish, which is a dip. There's dip now. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I don't even, do people even use regular nail polish anymore? God bless them if they do. Look, I do. <laughs> you still do? You still wait. I mean, I try, I tried to just use them for pedicures and I was just like, mm -hmm. look, I ruined my feet. <laughs> I just went to gel. Cause I'm like, I can't, I'm going to have little lines in my, right. in my toes. So, um, so what are you loving about, you know, the options with nails? Are they safer? What precautions should people be taking when they're using um, these different types of enhancements on their, on their nails. So you want to take into, um, account your lifestyle, um, mm -hmm. your ability to maintain and, um, budget, you know, those, those are the things that are extremely important all, all the while maintaining safety. So for me, I like using traditional polish because it forces me to sit still for probably at least an extra 30 minutes in the salon and do nothing. Okay. So it's my way. Of, That's a good rationale, actually. I if can't you want to slow down. Use use regular nail polish. Regular nail polish slows you down because you <laughs> like. I don't want this to mess up. <laughs> you don't. You got to sit there and you got to yeah. You got to sit there and, and wait for it to dry. Yeah. Okay. Wait for it to dry. So um, a part of when I get my services done, I intentionally do it. I take the day off or half a day off. I make it a Zen moment for me. It mm -hmm. forces me to slow down. So that's the method to my madness. Mm -hmm. um, plus I'm a picker, even though I'm a licensed nail professional, I will pick if, if I get a little edge on something on my nails, I'll pick it. So I like mm -hmm. traditional polish because it's so flat. And if it's starting to chip, I just take it off and then go make another yeah. appointment when it's time. So that's what works for me. Um, when it comes to trends, the um, to go down a rundown of a few of the ones you mentioned. So the dip um, nail trend or dip polish or dip service is actually acrylic. It's just refined acrylic that's colored. So think of mm -hmm. it as the difference between granulate, granulated sugar and confectioner's sugar. Okay. They're both sugar. They just come in different forms. So oh. if you get... Um, if you get an actual liquid and powder, either overlay or liquid and powder, and they add a tip acrylic mm -hmm. set, that is the mm -hmm. same product as a dip where they're just taking your nail and dipping it into the jar. Hmm. It's just that you're finding the acrylic in different forms. That's all. Okay. But they're both acrylic. So one is not better than the other. Um, my hesitation with the dip is just make sure that they're not dipping your hand inside of the universal jar that it came in. Right. They should be putting that dip powder onto a disposable something, mm -hmm. dipping your hand. And then when they're done with that, that needs to go in the trash. So if you're seeing right. them dip it back inside the big jar, don't go to that salon anymore <laughs> because it's cross-contamination. Yeah. Yeah. You're in healthcare. So you know. I work in healthcare. So we, if you're a nurse, you're not, you can't, you can't even wear dip. You can't wear dip. You can't even wear gel actually. Um, and acrylic and this, the, the acrylic, I haven't worn acrylic since look, I was probably in college, which was the mm -hmm. two thousands or right. actually the, it was the nineties really. So who's counting? <laughs> um, and so is that the same acrylic? Is that, has it, has there been any, in um, changes, changes, innovations with acrylic? Cause you know, the nails now in terms of like designs and stuff, they look really good. And I'm like, how are they doing that with just regular, is it paint? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how they so do they it. do now have like colored acrylic, like, you know, okay. um, late nineties, you know, early two thousands, they might've had a little bit of colored acrylic then, but or more like the early two thousands, but now you've got colored acrylic in all kinds of colors, you know, mm, vibrant okay. colors. And so when you see someone and they get their nails done with that type of acrylic, um, service the paint never chips because it is the nail so mm -hmm. that's great for someone that may be a little hard on their nails in terms of gel polish may not work for them or traditional polish um, that way they have more coverage so the opportunity for the uh, nail to like chip is must is less likely because the whole nail is built on that color right um, so it makes it a little bit sturdier so if you have dip or if you have acrylic or even if you have gel what's the best way to take care of your nails because I, I think, you know, people still want their natural nails under there. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, they get so thin because of the yeah. drilling and the, ugh. so it could be, so it's like, you got to make a decision. You, you want your natural nail or, or, or do you have to make a decision or do you have to make a decision and just switch, um, manicure and switch and switch nail techs. Right. Um, 
Is it um, possible to maintain your natural nails underneath acrylic gel? Um, and services? Dip? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So the biggest challenge with any sort of overlay is it changes the nail's pH. And that's what causes the nail to be more sensitive or softer when you remove mm -hmm. some sort of an enhancement that's been on long term. Um, and so what I would recommend, ac acrylic is going to be the hardest in terms of sturdiest out of all services. Then you have hard gel after that. And then you have gel polish and then you have traditional polish. That's kind of the hierarchy of strength. So Mm -hmm. If you've had um, an acrylic overlay over your nails um, or you've had a tip put on and then they put um, acrylic over that and then your nail starts to kind of grow up under there, um, the best way to kind of maintain is to consistently get your fill-ins or your maintenance or your rebalances. Mm -hmm. If you are not really good with that, that can cause um, your nails to be damaged, your natural nails, because they're having opportunities where water can get in because there's nail lifting that has an opportunity to happen. Because mm -hmm. if just imagine something that's been worn out for too long. Think of like your tires. Right. If your tires need to be replaced, you know, uh, once a year and you're waiting two years to replace your tires, the ride is not as smooth. So the same thing with your natural nails, that product that's on top of them is only going to last for so long and if you're not diligent with your maintenance, so going there every three weeks or every two weeks or every four weeks, whatever the technician is recommending for your service, if you're not diligent with staying on time, on time for that, then it can cause where your natural nails integrity can be kind of compromised. Um, but one thing that you can do to maintain strength is apply cuticle oil to the nails, mm -hmm. especially after you're interacting with water. So having a handy cuticle oil that you can put in your purse or keep in your pocket or keep on your desk at work, um, okay. wash your hands, put some cuticle oil on. That's going to be the best way to kind of combat along with on-time maintenance. So if you're not good with getting those rebalances done in a timely fashion, you may want to just focus on um, getting your natural nails to the length that you want. That way you're not worried about a time scale. Right. Okay. That was good information. Okay. Let's switch to lashes. Okay. So I've got, I have, I have horror stories with lashes. Oh, so no. I'm, my bet, my best bet is just to get the strip and put it on. Cause okay. anytime I venture outside of that, it's been terrible. And I got gotcha. you, I can tell you why, but, um, so now you can get like individual lashes. Yes. Like put on, what do you, what do you specialize in? So I used to be an international educator for Ardell, one of the um, largest mm -hmm. lash manufacturers in the U S Yep. And so we offered actually all three and I specialized in all three styles. So your main styles are strip or band lashes, which is what mm -hmm. you talked about. You have individual lashes, which are like clusters or flares. It's several of them kind of put together on one piece. Mm -hmm. And then you have extensions, which is literally one hair attached to one hair. So one false lash is attached to your one natural lash. So those are your wow. three categories of lashes. Uh, strip lashes are great. Um, I call them eyelash wigs. <laughs> you put them on right. in the morning, you take them off at night, you keep on pushing and they're reusable. Okay, so yes, that's me. That's what I need. Is that you? Oh, good. I yes. can't put them on, but look. <laughs> so let me just quickly tell you my horror story. So okay. um, there, so apparently there is a, is a procedure, not a procedure, a process you can do to lengthen your natural lashes, right? Uh, and they take your lash and they put some, some, I don't, oh. this is my fault because I didn't know what it was. I know. So she, she put something on my lashes. Yes. To make them longer. I don't know. I didn't know what it was. I should have asked. You had, a you had a lash perm. So they were curled or they were lifted. Did she use that word? She I don't remember what she used. This was, this was a few years. This was a few years ago, but okay. let me tell you what it did to me. It had the opposite effect on my eyelashes. They were so just like you said, it was a perm, but like a white people perm, not a black people perm. I think the effect that, we, that it was supposed to have was supposed to elongate my eyelashes, my natural eyelashes, okay. but no, they curled up into the tiniest four seed type <laughs> curls you ever, you ever saw. Like I was like, 
wow. When my eyelashes dried, they dried in little curls. Yeah, Jerry curl eyelashes. I had. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, they only became straight when they were wet. And when my eyelashes were wet, I'm like, oh, this is what I wanted. And they would right. dry up and curl into each other. And I, I, now clearly I didn't have long, beautiful lashes to start with. <laughs> so I was, cause I was having this procedure for like this process for a reason. Right. And so to curl them, I was like, that was, that was my, that was the last time I was like, no chemical, like just stick to the strip. <laughs> Eventually it grew out. Eventually yes, it, took, it, it took a couple of months yeah. for them to unfurl, Unwind. uncurl. It <laughs> uncurl. sounds like she used the, a too small of a rod. So it's two ways you can do that. There's a rod. They literally look like little bones. Okay. And they look, they're little, they're little round. And so you lay them on and then you roll them up on the lash. No, it was, she made them straight. Like she took my eye, like my eyes, eyelids, lashes were up. And she pushed them up. And oh, so she them. might've done a, she might've done a lift. Well, they did not lift. They didn't work. Okay. I had little, I don't want to call them nappy, but they were nappy, <laughs> nappy eyelashes, which obviously was the opposite effect. I had right. other stories. I went to Chicago, got into... Well, clusters. I think they were clusters because they weren't individual lashes. They weren't I could not get them suckers off. They were like on and then some fell off and some didn't. Yes. Um, they took my natural lashes off with them. It was a whole thing. So. Oh, no. Yeah, board. you have to, the extensions and the individuals, you have to go back to have them removed. And whereas the strip lashes, you just pop them off, pop them on. Yes. You can do that. That's DIY. But individuals and extensions do require maintenance. So And, and a professional. Yes, and someone else has to take them off. So, well, hello. She should have told me that in Chicago because I clearly live in Maryland. So <laughs> I was not. I did not think that through. That yeah. was a. That was a bad. It was a bad thing. So she I guess. Told me. <laughs> yes, she um. So okay. So lashes. Is, that's what's in the. And what about the? Do have you found success with the lashes that were the the glue is like a pen, like a, um, oh, the magnetic, magnetic lashes. Have you found success? Like, do you have a brand that works? Cause everyone I find it's on until you start either sweating or they just, and then they kind of like, you know, do do do. Um, I, to be quite honest with you, I'm not a fan of the magnetic, um, and it's just, I guess it's just principle. I haven't even tried right. them. I just don't like the idea of the magnet being so close to my eye mm -hmm. and, and the, and the, 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 the push and pull. And <laughs> I was like, well, they don't, no. I haven't found, I haven't found one that worked yet. Like it works for like an hour, but it's like, if you uh, okay. going somewhere. Yeah. So you might you have the good old regular adhesive. Just, mm -hmm. just go with the good old regular adhesive. Oh yes. Clearly and my experience with lashes, I just need to use a strip and that's what I've done. But at least you're uh, experimental though. That's good. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I am experimental. Um, yes, because that brings me to my next thing is, which is brows. Mm -hmm. um, microblading is in. Yes. I actually have my brows microbladed. Um, nice. I had zero. Here, I can take out my glasses. They but yeah. Nice. They look nice and powdery and you had a microbladed or shaded? Shaded. Yeah. Shade it. yeah, they look nice. So I did that because I had no lashes and I was tired of, I mean, no brows. And I was yes. tired of drawing on my bra brows and buying um, pencils every yes. two, three weeks. It was, it was annoying. And, you know, anybody like I followed this woman for six months. <laughs> I was like, Good. I'm going to see every shade of color, yep. you know, cause she, she was not, she was not black. She was a white woman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I need to know you could do black skin. These, these white yes. women. And they are. And I also noticed that on black women, she did shading and on white women, she did sh like, um, the blading strokes. Yes. Strokes. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't want strokes that I don't even like, you can't even see my individual lashes naturally. So that strokes right. wouldn't look natural on me. Right. Um, I, she knew that obviously, but, um, so that's one. And it's so, so funny. Cause I don't have a tattoo. This is my, my first tattoo tattoo was a face tattoo yeah. <laughs> for my eyebrows. Um, but if it's so assuming somebody doesn't want to go that route, did you do, mm -hmm. do brows or you don't do brows at all? I do, but micro shading and micro blading is not, uh, under our scope of practice as estheticians. It's actually, mm -hmm. you have to be a tattoo artist. So, um, oh, wow. in Maryland, you cannot, 
do microblading or micro shading in the same building or business enterprise as your beauty services. They have to be totally separate. Really? Because I know some yes. people it's not separate. Mm -hmm. Not my lady. She was she had her own business. That's all she did. That's all she was doing in there is eyebrows. Good. And for something like that, you do want someone that just does that. You yes. know, you don't want to go to someone that does that and something else and something else and you know, like mm -hmm. I need you to do that all day. So that was yeah. excellent. Excellent decision. Well, I'm glad it worked out. I was nervous for a second. I was like, wow, this is your face. It's, it's permanent. It's going to last three years. So right. uh, I hope, I'm glad it worked out. Um, and so the last thing is, is uh, let's talk about like waxes. Any mm -hmm. uh, waxing? Waxing. waxing. I, I love the waxing. Waxing is a beautiful thing. It it allows the hair to grow back at a much slower rate um, because it pulls it from the root. And there are several different types of wax. So what I always recommend when trying someone new, mm -hmm. the same way you examine the, the young lady for your micro shading, examine, you know, if they have a, a social media presence, examine the, uh, the esthetician that's going to be performing your waxing services. You want to make sure that they're working on people with your hair type or your skin tone, because mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, unfortunately, waxes are kind of developed and made for a particular type and it may not cover us. So mm -hmm. for me personally, um, I like to use hard wax um, because it seems to have more grip for our coarse hair. That sounds painful. What is hard <laughs> wax? That's not like so, the wax that they like spread on and then they put the paper and then rip it off. That's not that. So that's soft wax. When you have okay. muslin or paper that you lay down to pull it off or remove it, that's soft wax. Hard wax, the wax itself gets hard. So you still spread it on, but okay. the wax itself gets hard and you remove that. The benefit to that type of wax is it actually doesn't exfoliate the skin, meaning it doesn't remove a layer of skin. So if mm. you've ever gotten wax and the area looks lighter, a, right. it's lighter because there's no hair there, but B, it's also lighter because when you wax, you're literally exfoliating or removing a layer of skin, but that doesn't happen with hard wax. So hard wax is gentler on more intimate areas. So bikini- but it Brazilian, seems like it's harder to take. Is it hard? It feels like you got to rip that off. Like, like you it have seems to like it would be more painful. Right. No, well, you have to remove it. So it does have to be removed. <laughs> I'm not using the word ripped. You do have <laughs> I'm to sorry. Remove. Yeah, I was like, remove sounds too gentle for what is happening. That's not yes. that's not what's happening. You're right. right. No, yes. I'm just <laughs> but they do have um they have numbing products you can put on before. I always tell clients oh. take, take a Tylenol before you come in. Don't drink caffeine. Um, because caffeine is definitely gonna uh heighten that uh, you know, uh nerves in terms of you feeling the intensity mm -hmm. of it. But once you continue to do it on a continuous basis, again, keeping that regimented schedule, then the body becomes acclimated to it. You become acclimated to it. And then also the hair grows back much thinner. So me, I have very coarse hair and I'm actually mm -hmm. hairy all over my body, my arms, everything. So um, as you continue to wax, when the hair comes back, it grows back thinner and finer because you're you're weakening the follicle. Mm -hmm. And so slowly but surely, some areas hair won't even grow back. I think people. that's why I I have I think that's why it doesn't work for me because I get super nervous. I literally yeah. leave an outline of sweat on the table because I'm right. so anticipating the ripping <laughs> that I can't that I can't focus. The lady was like, "Wow, you're very sweaty." I'm like, <laughs> "Just do your job, ma'am." Right, right, right. Just, don't worry, don't worry about my sweat. <laughs> Work around it, work around it. Um, and it's probably why, because I I don't go back. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Um, but are you are, are you more prone? So I always, and I actually never had this experience, but mm -hmm. I feel like, are you more prone to ingrown hairs if you if you do waxing or no, you're not? Um, you can get ingrown hairs from shaving. You can you can That's get true. them from either. Um, you want to make sure you're exfoliating the area before, so prepping the skin for the hair being removed. Um, and exfoliation can be, you know, some sort of a scrub and that's you want to do that before you're done. Okay. You want to do that before. Was, okay. Because it makes it easier for the hair to come out because, you know, you kind of imagine if you're, if you're removing hair and the area in which you're removing it 
has a lot of dead skin, then that gives it that gives it kind of friction to where it doesn't necessarily want to come out. Whereas if you prepare the area beforehand, you're mm -hmm. making it easier for that hair to come out. Um, and then you want to use um, like products that like we talked about, kind of the no bump or some sort of, uh, uh, I actually use, uh, I have a um, anything that it's like for acne or mm -hmm. um, for the face, I would use like a right. wash like that in my private areas or my underarms or wherever I consistently wax. Because usually it has ingredients like salicylic acid um, that are going to help to combat any bacteria that may want to grow there to help with the acne. It can do the same thing with helping reducing the opportunity for um, those ingrown hairs. Um, okay. And then there are supplemental products, moisturizing products that you can use. So wherever you wax or shave, um, you want to make sure you're always moisturizing it. You need moisture because you're literally removing layers. And so you've got to replenish those layers with moisture based products. So that will help to prevent those things. And then okay. you can also do laser. Um, I'm actually starting my treatments with my esthetician for laser because I'm tired of waxing. Wow, they can do laser? Things. Okay. I didn't and know. They can do okay. laser on us. So yeah. you want to find an esthetician that is certified in laser that is certified in laser for melanin skin because yes. there are it's different for it I've is seen different. terrible horror I've, I've seen horror stories about black people in, in laser and people not knowing how to laser black skin yes you know, or melanin well the lasers skin. weren't meant for us the lasers were meant for pale or fair skin looking for dark hair whereas the laser when it looks at us it sees oh. nothing but darkness That's so, so racist <laughs> It's even that's it's racism in hair removal. I'm well, sorry. the people that's making the equipment, <laughs> who are they making it for? That's true. Okay, they definitely so, weren't thinking about us, but somebody did apparently in perfect. Somebody it. did. Okay. There was somebody in the room that finally said, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> black, "We have burnt enough black women. It is time to find a solution." Yes. They too want to have hair removal. Yes. Okay. So, and that also helps with um, excessive sweating. Like um, if you excessively perspire under the arms, mm -hmm. lasering your underarms will help with that. Oh, that's good to know. In mm -hmm. addition to um, removing the um, the hair. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you got to find you a good esthetician or, or y'all could use mine um, and, and go ahead and find someone that's certified within that area. But um, the young lady I use is icefacesbeauty.com mm -hmm. and she does beautiful work. And so that's good to know for, if you live in Maryland, I'm sorry. For DC or Virginia. <laughs> Maryland, DC or Virginia. Okay. That's good to know. Cause I, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't see anybody regularly. I probably mm -hmm. should, if I'm yep. looking to pamper myself more, if I'm looking to, like you said, it, it is part just taking care of yourself. And yeah. then a part of it is, you know, making yourself a priority, you know, even if, you know, even if it does have to do with taking care of, of things that are aesthetically pleasing, like your face or, your, yeah. you know, how you look, it's all, it's all good. And you, and you deserve it. So yeah. before we get out of here, I do want to ask you about your services for people with diabetes mm -hmm. um, and how you have. Um, and so you were telling me if you if you have diabetes, one of the um, common problems or common symptoms is, um, you know, having really sensitive skin that if it's either sensitive to product or maybe it's sensitive, like if it, it won't heal, if it gets cut they're very slow to heal. Not like, you know, not like we were discussing earlier, but something, you know, far more severe and they're more prone to, um, sores and ulcers and things like that. So you've developed a product for diabetes, um, patients. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the line is called joy of beauty and it's a diabetic friendly brand. And what that means is the products were made with diabetics, new and nursing moms, those that are suffering or have um, finished battling cancer, the elderly and those with limited mobility. It was made with all of those persons in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but if you find a solution for someone in the diabetic, diabetic community, you've really solved problems for people in all the communities that I mentioned mm -hmm. um, because they are so sensitive. So one of the biggest things that um, comes with diabetes is it affects the nervous system and the brain's ability to tell the body to heal or that there's a problem. Um, there's just such a delay in that. And so 
you and I can go get a pedicure. We can go get a nice sugar or salt scrub. No big deal. If a diabetic does it and the person providing that service is too aggressive with their um, exfoliation, it can cause little micro tears in the skin. Um, and you kind of know that that's happened when later that day you take a shower and your legs burn. Those mm -hmm. are, that's a sign that you have little tears in the skin. So for you and I, it's no big deal. It'll heal in a couple of days before a diabetic causing any sort of injury to the skin or breaking the skin can be uh, detrimental to a point of where it may need to be amputated if untreated. And so um, one product that I made in particular is a poppy seed and kokum whipped body butter scrub. Say that five times fast. Okay. <laughs> you the and expert. It's like, it just works. Okay. It just works. Um, and so we use poppy seeds in lieu mm -hmm. of sugar or salt because poppy seeds are a sphere. They can't cut the right. skin. And so you can safely use that product uh, as aggressively or not as you desire. And you don't have to worry about causing any injury. But then it also has really good really good ingredients like squalene oil and jojoba oil and mm -hmm. cocum butter, um, which is not the same as cocoa butter, but it's a really hydrating oil um, and butter that moisturizes the skin because the biggest thing with diabetes also is the disease as well as the medication um, affects the uh, skin in terms of it being extremely dry. Um, mm -hmm. It also affects the um, blood flow. And so a lot of times they're not able to get the same level of, um, yeah. of, of moisture and balance to the skin that, that non-diabetics have. So that line was created with those persons in mind. And the main reason was because um, diabetes affects the African-American community uh, about 60% mm -hmm. more than it does our white counterparts. Um, I don't have anyone personally that's been affected by diabetes, you know, that's in my immediate family. Uh -oh. We used to offer free monthly services to those in the cancer community. In the midst of them battling the disease, they could come and get free services with a doctor's note. And um, we would give them extra TLC for their services to make sure that they were safe and um, you know, um, not being at any further risk, but having an opportunity to kind of feel like they used to feel, you know, right. prior to diagnosis in terms of treatment. So my entire line is comprised of a scrub, a cuticle oil, um, a hair and scalp oil, uh, after shower body oil, um, as well as a foot and uh, a body soak that you can use for bath time. So that's amazing. I like that you um, thought about an underserved community who, you know, can't, who traditionally can't get these services because, you know, they have an issue. My mother-in-law um, has diabetes and she mm -hmm. deals with the exact same issues you just mentioned. And so mm -hmm. um, I think it's amazing that you have done that for, for people. So thank, thank you, you, Joy. This has been a great conversation. I've learned so much, all the things I was doing wrong, <laughs> some things I was doing right. Uh, you are so informative. Um, is there any, so you know, I will have your contact information um, in our uh, show notes, but mm -hmm. is there anywhere, like where can people find you on social media if you if you want? Oh, no problem. Yeah, on the socials, I'm at uh, Joy of Beauty Brand is um, my social media and same for website, joyofbeautybrand.com. And so um, between myself and my assistant, we're, we're working social media. So if you send me a message, I'll be like, hey. <laughs> All right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a great conversation and thank you for helping me with my son. I'm going to, as soon as he gets home from football practice, we're going to try it out. Try some of the his... things. Yes. Right. <laughs> exactly. Because I'm so upset about that. But thank you so much for, thank you so much for joining me, Joy. Thank Have you. Have a good one. And for everybody else, I will see you next time. Thank you.